Let's continue to worship our living and loving God. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that that you are God eternal. And we thank you, O Father, that we have the privilege to worship you. To worship you at this time of history. We want to thank you for the people who've gone before us, who have worshipped you, whom we read about in your living word. And you have been the same to them. Good, gracious, merciful and loving. We want to thank you, Heavenly Father, that you continue to choose to be the same to people like us. Heavenly Father, we bow our heads and We just want to thank you, O Lord, for the gift that we have, the gift of life. Dear God, we, we, we just pray and give ourselves into your hands, O Master, that you would be in charge and in control of our lives, be in charge and in control of all that we do, even, even our worship here, O God. We thank you that, Lord, you have told us about our enemy and his plans to kill, to destroy, to divide. We pray, dear God, that you'd continue to help us to remember and remind others of this, that we may continue to wear the armor of God, the armor that you give us, and that we would trust in you that you would give us victory, O Master. Heavenly Father, we, we just want to pray and, Lord, give ourselves into your hands. We thank you for this church and we thank you for all those who belong to this church, all those who are coming here and attending. Thank you, O God, that you've given us this family to love and to grow along with, O Master. Thank you that it is your plan that you chisel us, each one of us, as you fit us together into, into your building, into your house. Dear God, we, we pray and Lord, come at all of us here into your hands and we pray in a special way for Lord, the bereaved family of the Royals, we, we thank you that Jim is here with us and we just want to pray and come at his, his daughters and or their families into your hand. We, we pray that you'd come for them with the passing of Barbara and that you'd continue to encourage them with the hope of, of God of, of eternal life, that one day they will, they will see her. We pray, O oh God, for the funeral, the funeral service that will be held this Friday at 11 over here. We pray that that would be a celebration of, of Barbara's life and also a time where we can uh, join together and uh, support them and also encourage one another to continue to hold on to you. And so, Lord, we pray and give ourselves into your hands that you would continue to work in our hearts. Dear Lord God, we, uh, we pray, we just want to ask and pray, dear Father, that as we look into your word this morning, that you would that you'd speak to our hearts. We pray, O oh Father, that you would uh, open our eyes to the truth of your word. We pray, O oh God, that you would grant us ears that would, that would listen. We pray for hearts that will want to obey. We pray, O oh God, for, for your will to reign supreme over us. 
So dear God, we pray and give all of us here into your hands. Work in our hearts, O oh Master. And do what only you can do. For we ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Well, it's a new month and a new memory verse for us to memorize. And so this was this month's memory verse is from John 15, 7. It's much smaller than the, uh, probably the previous one. So hopefully, yeah. So hopefully this is easier to remember. Uh, so let's all say this together. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. John 15, 7. Now, I know that verse may be very sort of tempting for some of us because it can seem like Jesus is like a genie and in a lamp saying, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Right? It's, it's very tempting to see that verse that way. Uh, but I assure you, Jesus is not a genie. Okay? And please don't forget Jesus' conditions. For the second part, there are conditions. If you abide in me, and if my words abide in you. Right? And uh, so don't just take a verse, but read, I mean, the verse in its context. Please go, home, go back home, read chapter, John chapter 15 to understand the verse in its context. Otherwise, you will end up like this Christian, uh, this Christian man who decided to go on a diet because he was a little overweight, he was concerned, and so he went on a diet. And one of the main problems that this Christian man had was uh, with, eat, with his eating was that every morning on his way to work, he would stop for donuts every day. Okay, and that was one of his problems. And so when he decided that he would go on a diet, he decided to change his, his route to work, to avoid the temptation. Okay, and uh, so he went a different route. And as the weeks went by, he started to lose a lot of weight. And then one morning, without thinking, he sort of accidentally turned into the road, which would take him to the donut shop. And, uh, you know, at first he was going to turn around, but then he thought to himself, ah, oh, maybe the Lord is rewarding me for my efforts. <laughs> and so he prayed. He prayed, Jesus if you really want me to eat a donut today, then let there be an open parking spot directly in front of the donut shop. Jesus, if you really want me to eat a donut today, you know, let there be an open parking spot in front of that, directly in front of that donut shop. And so he prayed that and he drove to the donut shop and sure enough, Sure enough, on the tenth time around the block, <laughs> there was an open spot right in front of the donut shop. You know, if, if you persist like that, you will get whatever you wish for, even without a genie. You know, if you persist like that, you will get. Uh, so don't be like that, but let's, let's try and say this this memory verse again, okay? And let's mean it. Let's say this again. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. John 15, 7. See, Jesus is the wine. We are the branches connected to that wine, right? And we need to stay connected to Jesus like a branch needs to stay connected to a wine, connected to a tree. The branch needs to stay connected to live, to exist. We also need to stay connected to Jesus. And we need to live in obedience to Jesus' words. Like a branch, you know, living by deriving sap and nourishment from the stem. That's how we need to be connected to Jesus, abide in Jesus. That's how our life should be as Christians, connected to Jesus. But, 
We also need to be connected with one another, with each other. We are the church, the body of Christ. We need, we need to be connected with each other too. We have a responsibility to see that we are all growing to become like Jesus. But what keeps us together? What keeps us together? Is the church like a club or a store like, uh, you know, Sam's Club or Costco? Is, is the church like that? Is it a club or a store like Sam's Club or Costco where we pay some annual fees to become members so that we can get some perks like discounts and, and savings and other things? Is the church like that? Is that what a church is? No, absolutely not. What keeps us together is not our membership fees. What keeps us together as a, as a church is our commitment to Jesus Christ and his word and also our covenant with each other. Now, some of you attend Bright Hope, but all of you are not formal members of Bright Hope. And, and that is fine. That is fine. But... I need you to please think, if you've been coming to church, you know, for, for a while now, think about it and pray about it, because when we receive you as formal members of the Bright Hope Fellowship, then in that formal ceremony, we will covenant with one another, you know, by using a membership covenant like this. You know, the, the people whom we'll be receiving, they'll be making this covenant, uh, as a member of the Brethren in Christ Church, I accept the Bible as the Word of God, in which is revealed the way of salvation and the guide for faith and conduct. I witness to a personal experience of God's saving grace in my heart and express desire and purpose to live a holy life apart from sin and separated unto Christ. I covenant as a member of the Bright Hope Fellowship to be loyal to the congregation, to consent to instruction in the Bible doctrine, to support and sustain the services of the congregation by my regular attendance and prayers, to contribute to the program of the church as the Lord prospers me and to foster a spirit of Christian fellowship and oneness within the church. You know, this is something that, you know, formal members will covenant with, with other members. Um, See, if we don't have this, if we don't have this covenantal sense of belonging, if we don't have this covenantal sense of responsibility towards each other and a purpose, why we serve Jesus together, we won't really be serious about church. We won't really be serious about church. You know, church will be more like the experience of the three pastors who got together for coffee one day. And uh, in their conversation, these three pastors, uh, they, they found out that all their churches had bat infestation problems. You know those, those flying bats, the bats that fly in the night? Now, all, all of the three churches, they had bat infestation problems. And they had tried everything. The pastors, the churches had tried everything, sprays, fumigation, nothing helped. I got so mad, said one pastor. I took a shotgun and fired at those bats. It made holes in the ceiling, but it did nothing to the bats. The second pastor said, I tried trapping those bats alive. And then I drove 50 miles away. And I released those bats over there, 50 miles away. But those bats, they got back to the church before I could. They beat me to it. The third pastor was listening and he said, You know, I finally found a lasting solution. I finally, I finally found a lasting solution. Really? What did you do? Asked the other pastors, amazed. And so the third pastor said, Oh, I simply baptized those bats. 
and I made them my members. I haven't seen them since. <laughs> church can't be that way. And if we are really serious about church, then I think covenants like this will help. Now, in our study of the book of Joshua, as we come to the last few verses of the book of Joshua, in Joshua chapter 24, last Sunday we, we saw the people of Israel, they responded to Joshua's public, personal, passionate, and purposeful declaration. And we all know that, what Joshua said. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And when Joshua said that, you remember what the people said, right? They said, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. And then, Joshua probably gave them the shock of their lives with his response to what they had said. You know, they, they thought, oh, Joshua will be happy to hear us say, we also will serve the Lord. But Joshua said, you are not able to serve the Lord. For he is a holy God, he is a jealous God, he will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do harm, do you harm and consume you after having done you good. Joshua was saying, to serve God, you need to get rid of all other gods, all other idols, and give yourselves completely to God. Or don't give yourselves at all. Give yourselves completely or not at all. You remember the Ten Commandments? Remember the Ten Commandments? Not this one, uh, the movie, but the Ten Commandments which God himself spoke. Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. This is what Joshua was reminding the people about. This is who God is. So get rid of your idols and serve only God. He's a jealous God. And so when Joshua said that, the people again said, No, but we will serve the Lord. We will serve the Lord. And so Joshua spoke for the third time. And he challenged the people. You are witnesses against yourself that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. He's challenging the people that they will serve as witnesses against themselves if they did turn aside from God. They would condemn themselves by their own testimony if they forsook the Lord. And the people immediately said, yes, we are witnesses. We are witnesses. And so then Joshua speaks for the fourth and final time. And he says, he says to the people uh, in verse 23, then put away the foreign gods that are among you and incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. You see, Joshua is coming back to what he had said in verse 14 of the same chapter. He's telling them, get rid of the foreign gods that are among you and incline your hearts to the Lord, only to him, to the God of Israel. And without the slightest hesitation, the people shouted in verse 24, and they said, we will serve and his voice we will obey. The Lord our God we will serve and his voice we will obey. Again, remember, 
These people, as they are standing in front of Joshua, they and Joshua is telling them, get rid of you, you know, the gods, get rid of those idols. They have still not promised to do away with their idols. They have still not said anything about that. But at least they had come to some sort of a commitment now. And so Joshua takes them at their word. And we read verse 25. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and put in place statutes and rules for them at Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And he took a large stone and set it up there under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. So Joshua takes, he, he took them at their word and he made a covenant with the people. So before he dies, Joshua does four things to ensure that these people whom he's leading, that they'll stay committed and that they will remain true to their word and they would not deal falsely with God. See, that's what he says at the end of verse 27. Lest you deal falsely with your God. So Joshua made a covenant with the people, verse 25. He put in place statutes and rules for them. Again, at the end of verse 25. And then in verse 26, he wrote these words in the book of the law of God. He wrote these words in the book of the law of God. And that's the reason why we can read what those people had decided to do then. And we can read today and we can learn from it for ourselves. And the fourth thing, Joshua took a large stone, verse 27, uh, or at the end of verse 26, and he took a large stone and set it up there under the terebinth that was by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said to the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against us, for it has heard all the words of the Lord that he spoke to us. Therefore, it shall be a witness against you, lest you deal falsely with your God. This large stone would stand as a silent witness. That's what Joshua was telling the people. Now, as I had mentioned in the beginning, when we receive members into the church, you know, they need to make a covenant. Uh, you know, this covenant, which I spoke about. Uh, but as the people, as the, as the new members, as they join our church and they, and they make this covenant, all of us, all of the others, are witnesses. But we are not supposed to be silent witnesses like a stone. No, we cannot be silent. Because if you read this, if we see our brother or sister in Christ not attending the church, if we see our, br our brother or sister in Christ not trying to live a holy life apart from sin and separated unto Christ, then we cannot be silent. We cannot be silent. We need to first pray for these people. And then as the Lord leads, we need to gently remind them of this covenant that they have made with us. And we have to, in love, help bring them back to a right fellowship with God and a you know, oneness within the church. That's our responsibility as witnesses. Why? Why do we need to do this? Why do we need to do this? You see, the pieces of coal in that fire, they will keep burning together until they all turn to ash. They will keep burning together until they all turn to ash. But what happens, what happens if you take, take a piece of coal out from that bunch and you put it alone by itself on the side, what's going to happen? It's going to die out very quickly, right? The one that you put on the side, it's going to die out very quickly. Why? Because it doesn't have the other pieces of coal to, you know, to, to keep it in, in flames, to keep burning. It's by itself. So that's the danger. 
if we truly love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, that we must have a true loving concern for one another. How, you know, each one of us are doing, how we are growing. See, if a part of our body, if a part of your body, if an organ of your body, like your heart, if your heart is not functioning properly, what do we do? What do we do? We say, oh well, my kidneys are okay, so it doesn't matter if the heart stops, right? No. We go to the doctor and we get it treated so that our body as a whole functions properly again. So why don't we do that in the body of Christ in the church? Why don't we have a loving concern for the other parts of the body? I think one of the reasons is because we are, we are not truly covenanted with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. We, we are only friends. We are only friends. We are not covenanted with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. See, Joshua did not want the people of Israel before him to only be friends with one another. But he wanted, to, he wanted them to be covenanted people of God with a loving concern and a burden for each other that all of them would remain faithful to God and continue walking in God's ways. And so, that's what Joshua does. He, he renews the covenant with the people. He helps them to understand that they are connected with one another. They are responsible for each other. And then Joshua sent them home, each to his own inheritance. Each to his own inheritance. And after Joshua did all of this, we read in uh, verses 29 and 30 that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him in his own inheritance at Timnath Serah, which is in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. They buried him at the ripe old age of 110. A wonderful leader. A wonderful leader. And, you know, if they would write something on Joshua's tombstone, what do you think they would have written? on Joshua's tombstone. You know, you may have thoughts in your mind, but you know, they did not need to write something on Joshua's tombstone because it was written in the lives of the leaders he influenced and the people he led. Look at verse 31. That is, you know, what is Joshua sort of living what should have been written on his tombstone. It is living in the people. It says, Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. That's the impact that Joshua's life had upon the nation of Israel. What a great tribute to Joshua. What a great godly influence he had on other leaders and all and all and on all the common people my dear brothers and sisters do our lives leave an impression of godliness will it do will our lives leave an impact that will linger long after we are gone because of how we have lived for jesus Will the people who have watched us, will they also love and serve Jesus faithfully after we are gone? Think about that. And then think about the life of Joshua. We have to leave a godly legacy like Joshua. Joshua is a, is a remarkable testimony to the faithfulness of God. His life is a remarkable testimony to the faithfulness of God. But... There's someone else who also died years back 
at 110 years old, like Joshua. And verse 32 tells us who that is. As for the bones of, Josh, of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried, they buried them at Shechem in the piece of land that Jacob bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money. It became an inheritance for the descendants of Joshua. Uh, of Joseph, sorry. Uh, Joseph's bones, they were buried in the promised land because Joseph, when he was in Egypt, you, you remember he was like the prime minister, you know, just after the Pharaoh. When he was there as the leader of Egypt, he believed in God. And this was his dying wish in Genesis chapter 50. You know, this is what it says, Genesis 50, 24 through 26. And Joseph said to his brothers, I am about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to the land that he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joshua died, being 110 years old. They, embalm they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. You see, Joshua also, uh, Joseph also counted on God's faithfulness to bring the Israelites and even his bones into the promised land. And God kept his promise like he always does. And so Joshua and so Joshua and Joseph, two faithful leaders, they die at 110 and they find their rest in the promise, in the promises of God. They find their rest in the promised land. Joseph Joshua, Jesus. It, it's, I mean, it looks like it's probably good to have leaders with names that begin with J, right? Well, uh, I can't, yeah, I think my wife was shaking her head because, um, well, her father's name is James also. Anyway, that's just a PJ. But, um, but there's a third you know, there, there's a third um, burial over here. In verse 33, And Eliezer, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him at Gibeah, the town of Phinehas, his son, which had been given him in the hill country of Ephraim. Um, so the, the book of Joshua, if you remember, in chapter 1 of Joshua, it begins with the death of Moses. And then it ends with the deaths of Joshua and Eliezer. And also the bones of Joseph being brought into the promised land. So we close with uh, three burials of Joshua, Joseph, and Eliezer. Now all of these three graves, they testify to the faithfulness of God. Because, you see, all three of them, Joshua, Joseph, and Eliezer, they, were, they had once lived in a foreign nation, in Egypt. And in that nation, they had trusted God's promise to take his people back to Canaan, to the promised land. And they had remained faithful. They had continued trusting in God through the ups and downs of their lives. They had continued to hold on to God and his promises. And now, see, all three of them, they rest in the promised land. God had kept his word to Joshua, to Joseph, to Eliezer, and to all Israel. My dear brothers and sisters, are those examples good enough for you and for me to start trusting in God and in, and, in his unfaithful, and in his unfailing faithfulness? Are those examples enough for us to start trusting in God and in his unfailing faithfulness? He is the same. He is the same. But there's a hint of a problem. I don't know if any of you realize this, but there's a hint of a problem there in verse 
33, the last verse of Joshua. It says over there that, And Eliezer the son of Aaron died, and they buried him at Gibeah, the town of Phinehas' son, which had been given him in the hill country of Ephraim. Now, the issue is this. Um, priests were not given land. Priests were not given land. So how did Phinehas, you know, the son of Eliezer, the priest, how did he get land, you know, to bury uh, Eliezer there in his own, you know, place in his own plot of land. And that's probably a hint of the beginning of people moving away from God and, you know, his laws. It's the beginning of the downward spiral of the people of Israel, which we will see in the book of Judges. If you read the book of Judges that comes after Joshua, there you'll see the downward spiral. But the death of Joshua is also recorded in the book of Judges, but it, has, it, it ends very differently over there. It ends very different. It's a different perspective over there. And so allow me to read to you Judges chapter 2, verses 6 through 13. Judges chapter 2, verses 6 through 13. It's, a, it's the same. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. You see, it's, it's, it's very similar to how Joshua ends. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in Timnath Heres, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And now, listen. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them, and they bowed down to them. And they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. You see how it ends. Why is it? Why is it that we, you know, why is it that people tend to follow God only when they have good, godly, faithful leaders? Why is it that people tend to only follow God when they have good, godly, faithful leaders? If we have truly made a covenant individually, a covenant as a family, a covenant as a church, why can't we remember that? Why can't we remind one another to keep that covenant, to keep, to be faithful to God? It took only one generation for the memory of the great things of that the great things God had done for Israel under Joshua to grow dim and also you know the knowledge of God himself to grow dim it just took one generation So what did God do what did God do and this is what we read in you know, little few verses after that in, Judge, in Judges chapter 2. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he said, because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded their fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to, to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not. So the Lord left those nations, not driving them out quickly, and he did not give them into the hand of Joshua. God tested the people of Israel. He let those nations that remained over there, when Joshua died, he let them remain over there. Why? It says, verse 21, 
I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left in order to test Israel by them, whether they will take care to walk in the way of the Lord as their fathers did or not, to check whether they would take care or not to walk faithfully. God tested them. God tested them. And let me remind you, brothers and sisters, God continues to test his children even today. God continue to, continues to test his children even today. So please don't get upset when God does something to test your faithfulness. Why? Because God has a history. God has seen a history full of people who have made promises and not kept them. So please don't be upset with God when he does something to test your faithfulness. God wants you and me to remain faithful today and to teach the next generation to live out that faithfulness in front of them and to teach that generation so that they will remain faithful to him. Possessing the promise of God. That, that was the sermon series that we started off with in, in January. How, has this sermon series benefited you? I, I'm not asking for you know, praise or for nice comments about that. No, I'm asking to see evidence in your lives how God is using his word to challenge you and to transform you. I'd asked you to, to write to me. How is this you know, sermon series, how it has helped you? I did receive one letter from the entire church. I did receive one letter. One person wrote and said, how encouraging, you know, how very encouraging. And it was very encouraging to read how God's word had helped that person. Especially through the example of Joshua and Caleb going to fight the giants and claiming the promises that God had given to him. And so write, write to me and, you know, let, let's try and encourage one another. You know, you, you saw that, that song, um, you know, contest that's there. I've, I've told you before that even came, let's write songs. Let's remind ourselves and let's remind others how God's word has encouraged us. Let's close our eyes, let's bow down our heads. As we think about what we have heard from God's word about the faithfulness of Joshua, the covenant that he made with the people, the end of Joshua, the burials of Joshua, Joseph and Eliezer, faithfully, God keeping his promises to them in the promised land. And also the example of the people, the next generation, how they forgot. Where do you stand? As God looks at you today, what is he going to find? You know the answer to that. But it doesn't need to be that way. You can be as faithful to God as Joshua was, as Joseph was. Trust in him. Would you say a prayer in your heart and ask God to help you to believe in his promises, to remain faithful to you no matter what comes, and to also realize that God the Father, in his love for you as his child, has a purpose for those tests that he brings about in your life. To show you how faithful or faithless you are. Would you say a prayer in your own heart and respond to this message? If you've never trusted in Jesus, 
May I invite you to believe in Jesus. He died so that you could live. He died so that your sins could be forgiven. Would you believe in him? Would you confess your sins in silence? Would you repent? Would you trust in Jesus? Would you tell him that you want to follow him like Joshua did? Would you tell him that you want to be, that you want him to be the Lord of your life, master of your life? And would you give it all, your whole self, completely to him, to love him and to serve him? Please take a minute, please, please pray in your heart. Gracious Master, we thank you for an opportunity to give us to, to come back to you, to renew our commitment to follow you, to love you alone. Master, you have heard you have heard the prayers of each, ev of each and every one over here. And even our brothers and sisters who are joining us online. You've heard those prayers, O oh God. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that just as you were the faithful one, the faithful one to keep Joshua trusting We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would continue to bring to completion and to fruition the, the work that you have started in us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us that through the ups and downs of our lives, no matter what we face, that we would remain faithful, like Joshua, like Joseph. Lord, keep us Keep us from breaking your heart like the next generation of the Israelites. Lord, we give ourselves into your hands. We are human and you know our weakness. And so strengthen us and help us, O oh Father. We give ourselves into your hands. We pray, O oh Lord, that as we partake of of these elements reminding us of what Jesus, our Savior, has done for us. May we be renewed in our love for you. May we be renewed in our loving service for you. Help, O oh Master, that this would be a meaningful and a blessed, a blessing to each one of us as we partake in this communion. We give ourselves into your hands. Thank you again for listening. In Jesus' most precious name we ask and we pray. Amen. Let me remind you, in Genesis, right at the beginning, you know, there was an offering that was made by two brothers, Cain and Abel, Cain brought some of the vegetables. Abel brought a lamb. He brought a lamb. He sacrificed it for himself. One lamb for himself. Come to the book of Exodus and you have the Passover where a lamb was sacrificed for a family and the blood was put on the doorstep, on the doorpost. Remember that? One lamb for the family. And then in the laws, they had the Day of Atonement, where a lamb was sacrificed for the sins of the nation of Israel. But we have one spotless lamb of God who was sacrificed on Good Friday for the sins of the whole world for your sins, for my sins, our Lord Jesus. And that's what we remind ourselves 
this morning. So listen to these words that Apostle Paul wrote from 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. After supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. As the ushers come now and as, you know, as the plate is passed, may I request you to kindly hold on to the, to the bread and we'll partake in it together as a family. Body of our Lord Jesus, given for you. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. And be thankful. In remembrance, let's all partake in this bread together.
blood of our Lord Jesus Christ shed for you as part of the new covenant that he has made with you. Drink this in remembrance that Jesus Christ died for you and be thankful. Let's receive the cup together. Our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you again for, for dying on the cross for us in our place. We thank you, Lord, that you are the true Lamb of God. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for reminding us of what you have done to give us life, of what you have done to, to take upon yourself the wrath of God so that we don't need to bear it one day. We thank you, Lord. And we pray that even as all of us have partaken in remembrance of your body and blood, that you'd grant us grace and strength to live faithfully for you. Bless us, for we ask this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Let's close with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege to worship a living, loving God like you. Thank you again for reminding us that you are the same God, the same God who Joshua worshipped and who was faithful to Joshua. And we pray, dear God, that you would help us to recognize and realize and experience your faithfulness in our lives today as we hold on to you. Master, we ask and pray that, Lord, in the ups and downs of life, and especially, dear God, in those times when we struggle, that we would learn to realize, O oh God, that you have a reason. You have a reason to test us in your love and help that we may come out Lord, praising you and worshipping you. Lord, we, we pray that we would remain faithful, faithful to the end. Thank you again for the privilege to worship a God like you. Thank you for the privilege, O oh God, to have brothers and sisters to love. Thank you for the privilege, O oh God, to give to you in worship. So bless these offerings that we have received, O oh God, and use it for the extension of your kingdom through your church. Bless us now, O oh God, as we go from here out into the world, that we would live for you, that people who see us would see that we worship you, we live for you, we love you as the only one true living God. And may that make a difference in other people's lives too, God. Thank you again for listening. In Jesus' most precious name, we ask and we pray. Amen. Receive the benediction in faith. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the sweet communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, remain, and abide with each one of us, both now and forevermore. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. Hope you have a wonderful, wonderful week ahead.